ask that you be amongst us as we hear a difficult story today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. As we heard in the story of Jesus in the synagogue at Nazareth today, the truth can be difficult to hear, difficult to face, but we also heard it must be told. What are the Indian residential schools? What happened in them? Why did Canada and the churches let this happen? What does that history have to do with any of us? How do we move forward? To answer these questions, I'm going to tell you a story. Listening to stories, these are not just the pastimes of campfire gatherings or a nightly bedtime ritual for drowsy children. We often think of stories as similar to fairy tales, or even put them in genres like science fiction and fantasy, as we so often like to talk about here in this church. And thus, we often equate stories with the world of pretend, of the not real, not so. Stories are powerful. They can be teachers. <coughs> they can be tools of truth-telling, affirmation of what is important, of how we think, of who we are. We use stories to learn. Thinking back to the readings and what we do in our church each week, we hear the words, <coughs> then we interpret the words. Jesus and Ezra and the Levites read from the scrolls and they taught the people and the people listened. Today, we follow this same tradition in our church. This morning, we listen to the readings, the gospel, we're listening to the sermon, and a teacher will teach us and we will listen. Our teacher interprets the stories for us. We, the people, then reflect and discuss our interpretations together. We learn from each other and talk about how these stories have truths that reflect on our own lives, our own experiences. We have a tradition of storytelling, and it is a core part of our faith. Well, the story I will tell today is one that will challenge us, like the listeners at Nazareth, because it is sad, it's unpleasant, it is not one that we will want to hear. It will make us uncomfortable, but we will listen together. We will hear the truth together. We will bear witness together. In so doing, we will honor the survivors of Canada's Indian residential schools. And we will begin to reconcile the truth with the past and begin to understand our role in the present, and perhaps even see a way forward. Indian residential schools were for Aboriginal children only. They are called residential schools because the children lived away from home. The schools were funded by the federal government and run by churches. The teachers and supervisors were nuns and priests. This program existed for 150 years. It started in the mid-1800s and ran well into the late 1990s. And over that time, about 150,000 children attended. The program was the largest during the, mid the early to mid-1900s. So how did it come to this? The relationship between Aboriginal peoples and European Canadians has always been a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. The earliest treaties between Aboriginal peoples and Europeans were between the king's representatives, not just some local folk, but the king's representatives and various Aboriginal nations. The early peace and friendship treaties often spoke of the pledge for mutual assistance. It was not one-sided. It talked of non-interference in each other's affairs and a respect for diversity of different paths. And it was also timeless. These treaties were in perpetuity. They were not three-year contracts renewable upon review. These were meant to last forever. For at least 200 years, the late 1600s to the mid-1800s, the British and French partnered, partnered with different Aboriginal nations and considered them their allies. But all this was to change by the mid-1800s. At this time, we see the demise of the fur trade, when the top hat made of beaver felt fell out of fashion. Now Europeans perceived Aboriginal peoples as impediments to nation building. 
Aboriginal land was now needed to make way for railways and the transformation of land into farmland, timber lots, and cattle grazing ranges. Now the new nation states used the differences between Aboriginal and European cultures to demonize, demoralize, and denigrate Aboriginal peoples. This shift is seen, you can see it, you can see it in the local newspapers peppered throughout Canada. In parts of the land where the Aboriginal land was needed and they were now seen as impediments, you now read articles where Aboriginal peoples are called squaws and savages. They're depicted as criminals, as pitiful. We even heard the word, those similar words during the psalm today. Whereas during the time, and indeed still in parts of the country where the fur trade survived and where Aboriginal peoples were needed as partners, they were often called by their First Nations name, by their proper name. And the newspapers were filled with anticipation of their arrival with pelts from the north. Disease also played a significant role. Smallpox and flu wreaked havoc in many Aboriginal villages and communities. Older people were particularly vulnerable. And older people, this is important, they were venerated and some known as elders, who are keepers of the culture, not only repositories of learned experience, but also designated teachers the people's history and beliefs. For those who survived these epidemics, starvation often waited around the corner. There are many stories of entire communities being wiped out by these diseases. Surviving communities were in many respects fractured and broken. And this is the landscape upon which uh, Indian residential schools developed. By the early 1900s, it was commonly believed that Aboriginal peoples were within one to two generations of disappearing forever. Thus began a widespread movement by academics and government policy ma makers to preserve their culture as sort of a paternalistic salvation through rapid academic study to capture these cultures through photographs and monographs, take away um, physical representations of their culture, like totem poles that put them in museums and universities, right? Because it was all going to be gone within 20 years. For those who were left, the plan was to assimilate them into Canadian culture. Assimilation, what does it mean? It means transforming Aboriginal people to look, so to physically look, to think, to act, to behave, and to believe same things as Euro-Christian Canadians. At the time, assimilation was believed by the churches and the federal government to be a means of saving these people from certain poverty, starvation, and extinction. Again, we heard that today in the excerpts during the psalm. The government also knew that this plan would cost money and often referred to these assimilationist activities as the Indian problem. Here, for example, the words of Indian Affairs Deputy Minister Duncan Campbell Scott in 1920. Our object is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no longer any Indian question. The federal government believed residential schools were the key to assimilating surviving Aboriginal children. The churches, Catholic, Anglican, United, and Presbyterian, stepped in and believed it was missional work, a way of redeeming the poor and transforming the savage into a Christian, hardworking, God-fearing person. The calling to help the oppressed, bring good news to the poor. These Christian values are powerful and worthy, and we look up to them and embrace them today. And they're commonly represented in the New Testament, as we heard today in the reading from Luke. There were, however, additional factors affecting many of these schools which perhaps shaped the horrors that were to come. Many, many schools were physically distant from the homes and lands of the Aboriginal children attending, so they're separated. Many of these schools are also isolated from any other communities, so they're operating in these very isolated pockets, right, with nobody looking in on what's happening. Though they were funded by the federal government, the schools were far from well-funded. Often the schools had money only enough for basic physical structures, like a basic wooden building and basic, basic food supplies. Not 
not enough really to keep the place running. This meant that schools had to devise methods to feed the students. So students had to grow and tend their own gardens, feed the animals, but even that wasn't enough. Most of the time, the children had to work half days, either looking after the school themselves, all the cleaning, the laundry, helping with food prep, all those things, or the school hired them out in order to help earn money. Chopping timber, doing, uh, doing mending, doing things like that. So even though you're at school, you might only be in lessons for a small part of the day. All this to keep the heat on and food on the table. Unfortunately, when these values are combined with the views of the time, including paternalism, racism, colonialism, a sense of cultural righteousness or superiority, as well as the limited financial resources and the geographical isolation of most of these schools, we are learning now that the results were not what was intended. So I'm now going to take you on a little journey that looks at what it was like for some of these kids. And I'll try not to get too choked up. Okay. So it began when the children were gathered by the police or the RCMP or government or other church officials and were forced to leave for these schools. It was not an option. You didn't sign up. So here's a recollection from Isaac Daniels. Um, and this was after, this took place after the RCMP visited his dad earlier that day. So that night, we were going to bed. It was just a one-room shack we all lived in, and I heard my dad talking to my mom there. And he was kind of crying. But he was talking in Cree now, so I could understand. He said that, it is either residential school for my boys, or I go to jail. <coughs> so the next morning, we all got up, and I said, well, I am going to residential school. Because I didn't want my dad to go to jail. Many children had to undertake a long journey with many other stops to pick up more children, not understanding where they were going, what would happen to them, when they would see their families again, or how they would ever get back home. Here is a recollection from Howard Stacy Jones. He remembers it as follows. I was kidnapped from Port Renfrew's elementary school, so he's already in school, when I was around six years old. And this happened right in the elementary schoolyard. And my auntie witnessed this, and another non-native witnessed this. These two witnesses, they saw me fighting, trying to get away from the two RCMP officers that threw me in the back seat of the car and drove off with me. And my mom, my mom didn't know where he was for three days. Can you imagine? She was frantically stressed out and worried about where I was. And she finally found out that I was in Cooper Island Residential School. And then it was also how they took the children away. Marlene Casius remembers, there was a big truck there and it had a back door and that truck was full of kids and there were no windows in that truck. It was dark in there. And that was where we were all put. And you hear yelling, and the kids were fighting in there, and some, they were crying. And we were falling down on the floor because there was no place to sit. We were standing up, and it seemed like such a long time to get there. Alma Scott recalls, we got taken away on a big truck. I can still remember my mom and my dad looking at us, and they were really, really sad. My dad's shoulders were just hunched. And he, to me, it looked like his spirit was broken. When the children arrived at the school, they were registered and transformed. And I don't mean uplifted, I mean transformed. Their clothes and their belongings were taken away. I read about stories where children's parents made them special clothes or sent, made them a doll. All that stuff was taken away. They were given uniforms. They were checked for lice. All their long hair was cut into a uniform style. Their names were taken away. They were issued, they were issued numbers. So they're not even kids. You 
don't even have who you are anymore. It's gone. They were told they could only speak English and French. They're not allowed to speak their own languages anymore. And we all know that your language is your identity. Most of the children did not know English or French. So now you're bewildered and confused, and you do not know what's happening to you. And that right for calls. You don't have a name. You don't have an identity. You just have a number. And mine was 56. Bernice Jacks, she said. I was called, hey, 39. Where's 39? Yes, 39. Come over here. Sit over here, 39. That's what the way it was. I say it just the way they said it. I was 39. The children were then separated by gender into boys' and girls' dorms, in separate parts of the mission or school, sometimes in different buildings, and further into rooms separating them by age. <coughs> Wilbur Abrams remembers, my sisters were kind of in front of me. My two sisters, and we got up the stairs, got up. Somebody guided us through the door. and going down the hallway, and I didn't realize it, but they were separating us, girls on this side, boys on this side. And I was following my sisters. And all of a sudden, I felt this little pain in my, my left ear. And this, I look up, and I see this guy with a collar. And he's pulling my back by my ear and telling me I was going the wrong way. You're going this way. Oh, still pulling my ear. I've always believed that. I think at that particular moment. My spirit left. All of these excerpts are from the Truth and Reconciliations Report. It contains simple or ample documentation about the abuses suffered by children in these schools. They suffered abuses of all kinds. I encourage you to read the report, especially the survivor stories. So the church's association with residential school program ended by 1970. Most of the schools closed by the 1980s, and the last school closed in the late 1990s. So it's not that long ago. 1991, the federal government struck a Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. They started to hear stories about the residential schools. So this is news. The report published in 96 called for a separate inquiry into residential schools, but no action was taken at that time. Over the next decade, the federal government worked with churches to determine accountability, and in 2007, they started to disperse a $1.9 billion compensation package for survivors of the residential school system. Sounds like a lot, uh, but packaged out over time, it, it's only just money, right? up for what happened. They also want, needed to move this out quickly because people were dying, right? The survivors were dying. The Anglican Church issued a former, formal apology in 1993, the Presbyterians in 94, the United Church in 98, and the Catholics in 2009, although it was not accepted by Aboriginal peoples. The federal government apologized in 2008. So then, running from June 1st, 2008, until June 30th, 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission looked at the history of Indian residential schools, and its mandate was to document what happened to these students and come up with recommendations about how to move forward. So we've heard a little bit, right? There's a lot more, but we've heard a little bit. What do we do with this? In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he spoke about all of us being members of the body of Christ, he calls on us to see how all the parts, though different they may be, have a purpose and are connected. Ears, eyes, ligaments, veins, cultures, experiences, people. What connects all of us is not one interpretation of the Bible, nor is it a particular way of living. It is God. God is the tissue that binds us, both infinitesimal and infinite. God is in the body, in the spaces between the spaces. God is the design of the body. It is not for us to decide that the ear is no longer needed, or that the body would be better served by transforming the ear into another eye. 
Indeed, the body cannot function unless all members are supported. If one member is ailing, then the body is weakened. As Paul wrote, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. In this way, we are called as Christians to reconcile with each other, to recognize our gifts, our varying purposes, our diversity, to celebrate this, and in so doing, elevate the entire body, or as Paul refers to it, to a still more excellent way. The church has a role in reconciliation with Aboriginal peoples because of its role in the Indian residential school system. Financial compensation, it's but a part of this. We as Christians and as Canadians, whether it's citizens or residents, we too also have a role. For the path to reconciliation is to learn the tr is through truth seeking and truth telling, or as we also know it, education. To accept what happened, to learn the truth and to move forward. This is the way to healing. This is not a story about what happened to some people very far away that are unrelated to ourselves in both location and time. We are them, and that what happened to these children affects all of us. We have a shared responsibility not only to seek the truth, but to support healing. So I would now like to open it up, as we are accustomed to do in our church, for people's thoughts, things they'd like to share. And thank you for that. <laughs> I want to start by thanking you, Heather, for um, being a person who was brave enough to tell the story today. It is a difficult story to hear. You did it really well, and I think I learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you. As you were, yeah, I agree. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about a lot of people I know who. My, my work has been in the area of disability, and a, a great many people I know have been institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, in many cases, kind of apprehended from their families, or in many cases, their families were completely broken, and there was nothing else that was presented to them. And many lived in institutions for decades. And some are getting, well, many are getting older, and they look at the prospect of being reinstitutionalized as old people, and they're really, scared about it. And um, it's really horrible with some of the, the institutional history that people have had to live through. The wounds are very, very deep. And the inability to trust is very deep. And the need for healing is deep. Um, and you're asking, well, what do we do with this? Because we can't dance around being all cringy with people. Um, but Maybe for, for me, part of it is recognizing that people want to be valued. They want to be free people. Um, and they want us to be in their lives as individuals who will enable them to get on with their own life agenda, um, respectfully as partners, and uh, to not get in the way, but to be there to help when that's needed. And there's so much stereotyping that I do, you know, and there's so many like assumptions I'll make It's like you're a 39, right? And it's just, it's not true. Mm -hmm. But it's also deeply hurtful. So I don't know where, if that helps at all, but it's like, this is actually interpersonal stuff. But it also has massive policy implications. Because so we then say, well, they'd all be better off if they were in group homes, so or they'd all be better off if they had their own little school. Or, I mean, it's like, it's just more of the same. It's more, and, and people know it, and they don't like it. You know, so. Like you're getting to know people and finding out well, what's what's the better way, you know. Well, I like that getting to know people. Yeah, and and making our systems and our policies and our programs consistent with what's what's the better way, and instead of falling into the same old traps, and we just see so often the same old traps. Well, one of the things we did is um, accompanying your leaflet. There's a handout, and it is um, the ten sort of principles of reconciliation that uh, were adopted by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so if, you're, if you want to think about how you as an individual can move forward or be part of an ongoing conversation we hope to have at this church about how our church, our particular church, 
as well as part of the Anglican Church, how do we move forward? Reviewing and thinking about and even using the Ten Principles as a prayer, I think is a great way to start. I just wanted to know what, um, what happened to the, to the families, what happened to the children after the emancipation or the closure of these, these, these schools? So let's say you graduate from school. We can start there. You graduate from school. What do you do, right? So you supposedly have an education, but it wasn't education to become a doctor or a lawyer or a business owner. You were trained to cut wood or be a mechanic or a plumber, like the trades. And then if you go to the city, it means uh, you got to get a job, but there was a lot of racism, so a lot of people wouldn't hire these students. And if they tried to return to the communities, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how disease fractured the communities. Well, so did the residential schools. So you go back to your community. You don't speak the Aboriginal language anymore. You don't remember what the culture is or the ways. You don't know how to live off the land. So you can't survive at home. And you sure as heck can't survive in the cities. You're lost. So I would say what, in many cases, what's happened on a lot of the Indian uh, reserva reserves is that you have a community of lost and broken souls. Over time, there are many that are healing and moving forward and trying to get the energy and the will to move forward. But for many years, it was just a gathering in many communities of lost and broken souls. Like, how would you move forward, right? And you wonder why there's you know, a lack of sense of purpose or why people get into alcohol and drugs and that kind of stuff. The residential schools are turned home broken people. Now there are some, you'll also read in survivor stories, there's some people who have pretty positive recollections, right? Just like there's diversity amongst all of us, there's diversity of experiences, and some people did well off it and learned, you know, learned good things and were able to make a good life and be successful for themselves. But that was not the shared experience, but it appears to be the majority of kids. Yeah? So most of the survivor stories, Heather, are, when do they come from? What, what time period? Well, they had to interview them. Them. Yeah, so they had to, so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission interviewed survivors um, during that period, right? What, 2007 to, or 2008 to 2015. So these would be anybody who had gone to residential school. So some people are elderly. I think one of them I read was from 1945, um, but most of them would have been later than that, right? At the time, I think you get those direct recollections from an earlier period. There were, there, I believe there have been some collections of histories that have been published prior to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just say, so uh, this is the first in a series of events that we'd like to do to address um, the residential school tragedy. Um, the committee that was formed around that is continuing its work, so if you want to join in, please come to the meetings. Um, the basic uh, plan is that this would be uh, helpful to give a bit of a historic sense and give us a bit of perspective on just the history and kind of lay out a bit of a timeline. And, and um, uh, others have done so, but I will also thank you, Heather. It, it is an extremely difficult story to tell. And I think also some of us are reluctant to tell it because we do not feel qualified, right, to speak it, of it. You know, and to be honest, it's one of the reasons why I was reluctant. Uh, so thank you for, as our kind of historian on <laughs> Canadian history, to, to be providing us uh, with that perspective. And I'm sure you'd be open to questions later on if people want to come to you with them. There's lots of material online, of course, besides the Truth and Reconciliation Report. There's lots of other resources that have been developed. Uh, you can look at the, the Anglican Church has a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the United Church has a bunch of material. And, and various other stuff is, is out there. Um, I, I'll say that you know, these are difficult stories to tell and to, to sit with, but they're important because you know, empathy is a muscle, right? And by telling these stories, listening to them, hearing them, we expand our capacity to love. And that is part of the way that we move forward, is learning how to be better at loving other people, especially those who are very different from us or who have experiences of, of isolation and pain uh, of the kind that resulted from the residential school tragedy. So um, I invite you to just go into that pain and, uh, and then come out of it again. We uh, continue our service, I believe, with the...